So good morning everyone. This is lecture 8.1 of the group theory course. Uh, we start here chapter 8. Chapter 8 it's, is, is on molecular vibrations and applications of group theory uh, in molecular vibrations. So this is the second application on molecular physics and uh, it's actually the last one. The next chapter, chapter 9, we're going to start dealing with, uh, with solids, periodic systems. Uh, but, but now in this chapter we discuss uh, properties uh, of molecular vibrations based on, on group theory. Uh, I, I would like to start with uh, some background on, on the physics of molecular vibrations uh, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, you have seen this perhaps in, in <clears throat> uh, either uh, courses on atomic and molecular physics or um, solid state physics. So this is going to be very quick and, and very basic. But if you want a somewhat uh, longer discussion on this uh, basic results you, you can the, the, our textbook has but other other textbooks on 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 condensed matter physics or molecular physics you can also find that <clears throat> but but I, again I'm, I'm I'm assuming that you know all that and actually that's not going to be very important for the group theory discussion so it's just a, an introduction okay so this is a quick review on the properties of molecular vibrations and the harmonic approximation. So um, we, we are going to consider a molecule with n atoms and uh, if you want to, <coughs> if you calculate or if you try to analyze the, the potential energy it's going to be a function of the of three n coordinates, so the, the Cartesian coordinates of all n atoms in the molecule. So this is the <clears throat> the potential energy of the system and uh, as usual what what we do is to expand this potential energy with respect to, to the minimum energy to the ground state uh, that determines the, the equilibrium po positions of the molecule so uh, you, you start from the equilibrium positions and you make small displacements uh, about these equilibrium positions and you take up to quadratic terms in your potential energy. So this is called the harmonic approximation and <clears throat> when you do that you end up with a, a Hamiltonian containing two different terms, the kinetic energy term. Uh, this is a sum over all atoms in your system. Mk is the mass for each atom and the potential energy term in which again K and L are in indicate uh, atoms and coordinates this is also atoms and coordinates three coordinates for each atom and you have the second derivative with respect to displacement so uh, Xi are displacements of atoms or directions with respect to the equilibrium positions and this is a you see this is a kind of matrix element of a square matrix. Uh, this square matrix is called the force constant or the Hessian matrix and the, or the matrix of second derivatives of the potential energy with respect to displacements. Okay? So then what one typically uh, does is to diagonalize this matrix and, and go to normal mode coordinates. You, you, well, there are several steps. I, I'm, I'm kind of skipping all these steps. First of all, you have to normalize these displacements uh, by multiplying by the square root of the mass of each atom. And then after you do that, you, you diagonalize the matrix. And in the end uh, of this procedure, you basically can write uh, your originally original uh, potential energy and then it becomes diagonal is a sum of diagonal terms in uh, and and the eigenvalues of your 
FCM or, or Hessian matrix are omega square. They are the, the frequencies of oscillations square. Okay? And the normal modes, the eigenfunctions or, or the eigenvectors of these matrix are this, this, the displacements of normal modes, the normal mode coordinates of your system. Okay? So this is the procedure. So uh, what, what, what's the use of group theory in, in, in this field? So a group theory, as, as we are going to see by several examples, uh, will be able to first identify the symmetries of normal modes. And by doing that, it's going to help us in diagonalizing the, 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 the Hessian matrix by putting it in block diagonal form. Uh, this is very similar to what we did uh, for electronic states of molecules. So there's a analogy here, okay? All right, so, so again, let me just write down this again. In, in this uh, form, I, I'm actually, I, I change notation uh, from psi to u, u are the displacements from from the uh, from the uh, equilibrium positions, and here you have an explicit representation of this force constant matrix uh, phi. Uh, you can see here this is a second derivative of the uh, potential energy with respect to displacements of atom one atom 1, atom 1, atom 2, and or actually the index uh, go, runs from 1 to 3n, so the same index goes, goes through atom number and Cartesian coordinate, x, y, z. So it's a 3n by 3n matrix, right? That's the point I want to make. And there's also, a, uh, it's called the, the matrix of force constants bec because in analogy to the harmonic oscillator. So uh, this, is, this looks like the, the spring constant or, or force constant of a harmonic oscillator, right? And, uh, and, and that's precisely uh, the interpretation. You can rewrite this instead of in terms of a, a second derivative of the potential energy. You can rewrite that in, uh, in terms of the first derivative of the force, so in, uh, with a minus sign, right? Because you know the force is minus uh, the, the uh, derivative of the potential energy with respect to displacement. So the, the one uh, interesting way to interpret a certain matrix element, phi uh, mu nu, is uh, by uh, uh, thinking of it uh, in the following way. You, you take a displacement of a certain atom in a certain direction, in a certain coordinate, and I call this combined thing, uh, atom and direction, I call it nu. And uh, I see what is the mu component of the force in a given another in another atom so and the ratio between the force and the displacement is precisely one of those matrix elements and so I can imagine that there is a, some sort of spring uh, uh, joining those two atoms and that's the I mean that's that justifies the interpretation of this matrix as the matrix of spring constants or force constants okay um, so when, when you do that, uh, again, when you diagonalize this matrix, basically you decouple all the normal modes. So your system becomes a collection of uh, independent uh, harmonic oscillators. And, uh, and, and uh, each oscillator is going to be a normal mode. So uh, the, the atomic displacements are going to be given by the normal mode coordinates. Okay? All right. So as I said, uh, the eigenvalues are going to be omega square, and the eigenvectors of this matrix are going to be the normal mode displacement vectors. So you you, you have to imagine uh, 
a, a small vector, a small displacement vector in each of the atoms and the collection of all these vectors for all the atoms is going to be what I am calling one normal mode displacement. All right, <clears throat> very good. So let's, uh, as an example, we're going to do this example in more detail today. But just to show you what, uh, how these normal modes can look like for the water molecule. <clears throat> this is the water molecule, oxygen, one oxygen, two hydrogen atoms. And uh, we are going to actually find those, these results uh, today. These are the three uh, normal modes. Uh, displacement and frequencies of the water molecule. We have three modes of vibration. One which is called the symmetric stretch mode. You can see that it, this is like the bonds are, are being stretched. This is the highest frequency mode. Um, and you have this, this uh, bending mode in which a in approximately the, the bonds do not change too much in length but the, this angle changes when you vibrate the molecule. Uh, bond bending forces are, are usually uh, smaller in the sense of less restoring than bond stretching forces so uh, typically bond bending modes have smaller frequencies than the bond stretching modes. And you have this other one, which is not so easy to identify or to anticipate, which is the asymmetric stretch mode. This is also very high frequency. All right? <clears throat> very good. So this is an example for the water molecule. So I, I'm presenting here three, just I'm saying to you that the water molecule has only three um, uh, vibrational modes. But then it seems strange, right? Because this, I, I, I told you that this uh, matrix is 3n by 3n, where n is the number of atoms. So in the water molecule, I have three atoms. So this should be a 9 by 9 matrix, right? So, and, and I should have, instead of 3, I should have 9 eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So why 3 and not 9 uh, modes? And the reason is that uh, we have to take into account and subtract the translations and rotations of the molecule. The translations and rotations, they are solutions of the uh, uh, diagonalization process, but they, they cost zero energy. Uh, so they have zero frequency. So you translate the molecule in either X, Y, or Z, coordinates, so these are sets of displacements in which all the atoms have the same uh, displacement in either X or Y or Z, and uh, these are solutions of this uh, diagonalization problem, but we are not interested in those solutions, so we have to subtract them. And the same for rotations, you can rotate around three different axes, Rx, Ry, and Rz, and this also uh, uh, does not represent a, a vibration of the system, so we have to subtract that as well. So we have in the total six zero frequency modes of this matrix, and and that's why I have only three vibrational modes. So I have a nine modes, uh, six, uh, sorry, three translations, three rotations, and I'm left with three uh, uh, r vibrational modes. And uh, we are going to see that we have to do this exercise uh, when we apply group theory to, to analyze the modes. We have to, again, subtract the irreducible representations corresponding to translations and rotations to obtain the irreducible representations for the vibrational modes. Okay. So let's, uh, that, that was the background or... or uh, review on the basic properties of uh, harmonic vibrations in molecules. Let's start with our group theory uh, analysis of molecular vibrations. And as I, as an, as I said before, <coughs> this is very similar to, to molecular electronic states. Uh, in this case now, uh, what the normal mode displacements 
are going to transform according to the different irreducible representations of the group. So uh, if you think about it, you, you take a, a different, a, a certain pattern of uh, or normal mode displacement, and you try to figure out uh, when you apply different symmetry operations of the group, how it, it it's going to transform. Okay. So um, so using the same argument that we did for the electronic states we expect that when you when you apply some symmetry operation r to a given normal mode coordinate or normal mode displacement we're going to obtain a, a linear combination of all normal modes that are degenerate in energy they have the same frequency omega k okay so this is the same thing to say that uh, the normal mode coordinates are going to act as a basis for uh, the irreducible representations of the group. So it's, it's a complete analogy with respect to what we have seen already. Okay. Okay. But notice that uh, displacements are vectors. Okay. So they transform like vectors. So uh, it, the problem is uh, you have you have to uh, imagine. Uh, each displacement on each atom transforming like a vector, having the properties of a vector. And this is completely analogous to the p orbital problem in molecules that we have discussed in, in, the, uh, in the previous chapter. Okay, so it's going to be very similar here. So following the, on those uh, footsteps that we have already discussed in previous chapters, this is then the recipe to find the symmetries of normal modes, to analyze the symmetries of normal modes. The first of all, the first step is to identify the point group of the molecule. The second step is to analyze the equivalence representation and find the characters of atom sites uh, for that representation. Then I have to find the representation of molecular vibrations so and, and decompose that into irreducible representations of the group. So the, the way to do that, again, is very similar to what we did in the previous chapter. I multiply, I do, I make the direct product between the equivalence representation and the vector representation. I look in the character table of the group where are the, the vector components x, y, and z, so I know uh, what are the irreducible representations that transform like the vector, and I make this direct product, and then I have to subtract the translations and the rotation, okay? The translations are the same as, the gamma translations are the same as the gamma vector, because again, they they are precisely the translations along x, y, and z coordinates, and the rotations are the rotations around uh, the three Cartesian axes, uh, x, y, and z. So this is going to be uh, in the character table. I have to look where x, y, and z are located, and to which irreducible representations they they uh, correspond to. And for this guy, I have to look where Rx, Ry, and Rz, angular momentum uh, basis functions, are located. And then I have to subtract them. And after we do that, then I, I, I uh, obtain the, the different uh, IREPs, irreducible representations of the molecular states. And what I have to do now is to use if I if I want to find the functions the, the the partners or normal modes in this case, uh, which are going to be the basis functions of uh, IREPs, I have to use projection operators. Same thing as we have done in, in chapter four, for instance. Okay, and we're going to see how this works uh, by examples. Also, uh, we. We can, after we do that, uh, this is something that I'm going to discuss uh, 
in the end of this lecture, one extra thing we can do is to analyze which one of these vibrational modes are, are active by infrared absorption or Raman scattering. I'm going to discuss in this chapter the selection rules for infrared absorption and Raman and uh, as we're going to see, not all uh, normal modes are going to be visible by uh, either one of these experimental techniques. And group theory is very powerful in telling, one, in telling us specifically uh, which normal modes are going to be uh, Raman active or infrared active. Uh, and this is also an interesting part of this chapter. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> okay, so um, let me uh, briefly uh, uh, discuss uh, how we find the vibrational normal modes using the projection operators that we have discussed in, in the previous, uh, actually starting from, from, chapter, from chapter 4. If you remember, this is actually equation 4.38 of our textbook. <coughs> this is going to be more clear when we discuss examples, but uh, uh, in general terms, this is, uh, I'm going to present some, dis uh, some ideas related to that. If you, if you remember, this is the one sort of uh, projection operator that uh, actually depend on, on the characters and not on the matrix elements. This is the sim a simpler type of projection operator. Uh, if you remember the discussion on, on chapter 4, when, when I apply this projection operator to a certain function, it will give me a, 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 a function that transforms according to this particular gamma n representation of the group. But it's not going to give me necessarily one of the partners, but uh, a linear combination of the partners, okay? But a as I, I'm going to show you, this is going to be sufficient for our discuss discussion here. Okay, so let, let me do a simple example. Uh, let me take, uh, suppose I, I want to look for vibrations of the CH4 molecule. And uh, this is the point group TD, the tetrahedral point group. And then uh, let's suppose that I want to find the, the totally symmetric uh, vibrational mode that transforms like the totally symmetric or identity representation A1. So every molecule will have a, a, a normal mode that uh, transforms like uh, the identity representation and the, the, as we're going to see this normal mode uh, is uh, invariant with respect to all symmetry operations of the group. So how one could do that using, using the projection operator? So the way to do that is you, you start, you, you, you draw your, your CH4 molecule. This is a CH4 molecule, carbon and four hydrogens. And then you, you make arbitrary displacements in one of the vectors. With, with some experience, then you, you start to learn that the, the displacements that we start with, it, it's better not to take them actually too much arbitrary, but you, uh, uh, with some uh, symmetry properties that you know in the end uh, that your representation are going to reproduce. But this is this will come with after we do some examples. But let's suppose I start with this set of displacements, a, a, dis, a displacement along this direction in, in this carbon, in this hydrogen atom, and along this other direction along uh, um, the, for for the, the carbon atom. And then you apply the projection operator. The projection operator is a sum of all uh, different uh, symmetry operations of the group multiplied by the character. But for the A1 representations, all the characters are one. So this is not so important. And then, so I basically, I have to sum 
over all uh, vectors that I, I get when I apply the, uh, the symmetry operations of the group. So when I apply the, the identity, the vectors are the same. So the, this is the starting this is the starting vectors, but is also the vectors that I get when I apply the identity operation. Let's see what happens when I apply the C2 operations. The C2, it's not easy to see, but this is one of the C2 axes, okay? And this is, I, I chose my displacements such that the, it's a, a parallel to C2. So, uh, so when I apply C2, this actually sorry this particular c2 axis uh, takes this vector this atom to this other atom right here so this is actually the result of e plus c2 okay this guy goes here and for the carbon atoms uh, it goes to minus the displacement goes to to the minus the original displacement okay and then you keep doing this for all symmetry operations of the group. I'm not going to do that, but in the end, for this particular case, uh, as you're going to see, after you sum all these vectors, after you do this sum, this is what you get in the end. A zero displacement for the carbon atom and the radial, radial displacements for all the hydrogen atoms. So this is the A1 mode which is also called the breathing mode of this molecule because I mean the molecule keeps its original symmetry it only vibrates um, and, and um, like it's breathing like it's changing its uh, bond lengths but the original symmetry of the molecule remains so it's a totally symmetric normal mode. Okay, this is a an example of the use of projection operators to find the normal mode. So we're going to see another example later today. So uh, sometimes it's not necessary to do that. You can use some physical insight uh, to find from from the beginning what are the normal modes this is actually going to be very simple for the a1 mode for the totally symmetric displacement um, but not so simple for other modes as we're going to see <coughs> all right so let's start uh, with uh, uh, a simple example which are the normal modes for molecular vibrations for the water molecule Okay, this is a very important example because, I mean, because water molecule is very important. Uh, this is the water molecule and uh, one oxygen, two hydrogens. And I chose the, our, our axis, uh, the Z axis is right here, is the main symmetry axis. And this is X and uh, the Y axis is out of the plane. Okay. <coughs> So I have uh, four symmetry operations of the water molecule, the identity, a C2 axis, which is a rotation around the Z axis, uh, and two vertical planes, sigma V and sigma V prime. The, the vertical planes is one of, is the XZ plane, which is this plane of the molecule, is a symmetry plane, and the other uh, vertical plane is the XY plane this plane is also a reflection plane of the molecule reflection symmetry of the molecule I call that Sigma V prime okay so these are the four symmetry <coughs> operations of the molecules these are the C2V group this is the character table of the C2V group I have four uh, four uh, representations all of them are 1D representations one dimensional representation this is a very simple group. Okay, as I said before, the first step now, actually the second step now is to calculate the equivalence representation. And uh, if you remember, we do that by looking at, for each one of these um, symmetry operations, 
how many atoms remain invariant okay I have three atoms total so when I apply identity the three atoms remain invariant when I make the C2 rotation only the oxygen atom remains so the character here is one for the Sigma V all the three atoms remain so this is three and for the Sigma V prime is one <coughs> These are a reducible representation that now I have to reduce in terms of the irreducible representations of the group. In this case, it's very simple to see that this is basically 2A1 plus B1, okay? This is the equivalence representation decomposed in the IRAPs of the group. <coughs> All right. Okay, so... What I have to do now is first I have to identify what are the vector, what is the vector representation. So I do that by looking here. I have Z here, X here, and Y here. So the vector is actually A1 plus B1 plus B2. And I know already that uh, I, I get this guy from Z, this guy from X and this guy from from the Y coordinate okay okay <clears throat> so now I I will try to see what are the the, the um, vibrational uh, representation as I discussed in the previous slide I obtain that by doing a direct product of the equivalence representation with the vector representation, which I know already what 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 uh, the vector representation is. But then I have to subtract from the translation, and and I have to subtract also. The rotations okay so um, all right so what uh, what is the result of that so this is 2 a1 plus b1 direct product with the vector representation which is a1 plus b1 plus B2 minus the translation the translation is also the vector minus A1 plus B1 plus B2 minus the rotation the rotation I have to look here what, what is the rotation representation the rotation representation it's uh, A2 plus B1 plus B2. And I know that this is rotation around Z. This is rotation around Y. And this is rotation around X. Okay. So, okay. So I have to subtract here. A2 plus B1 plus B2. All right, so let's do this direct product then. Um, okay, this is going to be equal to A1 times whatever is here is whatever is here. So this is 2A1 plus B1. Now B1 times 2A1 is 2B1. Now B1 times B1. B1 times B1 is B1 square, which is precisely A1. You can see the characters, right? So this A1. Now B2 times A2 A1 is 2 B2. And B2 times B1. So let's see the characters. So B2 times B1 is 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1 which is A2, so plus A2. 
right? Then subtracting A1, B1, B2, A2, B1, B2. Okay? So, and then after you do the, the math and you subtract all of, uh, then uh, you, you see that you are left with just 2A1 plus B1. So these are the symmetries of the vibrational normal modes of the molecule. First of all, you notice that you have three non-degenerate modes. And of course, because you don't have the genet, uh, you don't have uh, representations with dimensionality larger than one in this in this group. So we have three. In the end, we have we are going to have three normal modes which are non-degenerate, th three different frequencies. Okay, and. Um, and that's uh, what we have already discussed for the water molecule. So this, the, the now we, we can start to identify the symmetries. Um, this, of course, is the A1 mode, and this is also A1 mode. So these are the two A1 modes. You, you see that uh, they don't change the symmetry of the molecule. Okay, although the atoms are displaced with respect to their 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 symmetry the, so, with respect to their equilibrium positions, the symmetry is invariant. That's the important point. Okay? And how do I find these modes? Well, uh, again, uh, the, the, the correct way to do that was, is going, was uh, using uh, uh, projection operators, but uh, with some experience, we, we know that this is some sort of... Uh, of uh, bone stretching breathing mode so we, we have radial displacements from the hydrogen with respect to the oxygen but in order to uh, preserve the center of mass the certain the center of mass has to be uh, fixed for all vibrations okay so then if the the hydrogen atoms move up they have some some vertical component positive vertical component, then the oxygen atom has to move down. All right? And of course, this is oscillating all the time. This is just a, a snapshot of one particular frame of this dynamical uh, movement. All right? And the, the amount, of the, the magnitude of those displacements are going to be dependent on the uh, the masses of the oxygen and and hydrogen atoms this we're not going to be uh, worried worried too much about that okay this is the other <coughs> a1 mode the bond bending you see that the bond length don't change much but you you change the, this angle and this is a so-called bond bending and this is also a1 mode the B1 is harder to, to get, but I mean, this is a, the B1 mode. So uh, one possible way to, to identify the, the B1 mode is uh, when you look, uh, for instance, the character the, of B1 uh, for the C2 operation is minus 1. That means that when you rotate along the z-axis by pi, this mode has to change sign, all right? And this is precisely what happens for this mode. If you, you remember, this is the z-axis, and you rotate by by 180 degrees, and you see that all the the vectors here are get a minus sign. Okay, they point in the opposite uh, direction. So that's one way to anticipate what the B1 mode should look like for the H2O molecule. <coughs> okay, so now let, let me discuss uh, about uh, infrared activity. So, uh, as I said before, we are interested in, in determining what are the selection rules for 
um, infrared absorption. Um, and we are going to use the, the same concept of selection rules that uh, we discussed, uh, I guess, in, in chapter six, I think. And the f then the first step is to identify what is the perturbation Hamiltonian that uh, describes infrared absorption. So uh, uh, once again, I'm not going to 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 uh, uh, derive this specific form of the Hamiltonian. I'm going to assume that you know that or Again, this is not going to be very important. So just, just consider that I'm giving that to you. So, but w w what is it, the, the Hamiltonian that describes the infrared absorption? Uh, it's, it's simply this uh, Hamiltonian in which E is the electric field of the electromagnetic radiation and U is the induced dipole moment of the molecule so it doesn't matter if the molecule has a permanent dipole moment already like, for instance, the, the water molecule, it, it does have a permanent uh, dipole moment even in, in ground state, right? Because oxygen, oxygen is negative uh, uh, and hydrogen is a little bit positive, so it has a dipole moment in the ground state. But that's not the point. Uh, for the infrared Hamiltonian, what matters is the induced dipole moment, that is, the change in dipole moment when you apply a certain normal mode displacement. That's, that's what going, what's going to be important in, in determining the, the infrared activity. Or, um, so, as you see, this is, uh, transforms like the components of a vector, of a vector u. E is a constant, right? So, so we have to analyze uh, the selection rule in a, in a in a very similar way to the in the same way we did in chapter six the, in, for this specific case of infrared selection rule so uh, I have some some initial state initial vibrational state psi i and then I have the the uh, perturbation Hamiltonian that I can just write as the vector here and I have some final vibrational state psi f so this is the initial state and this is the final state and uh, as we you remember from from chapter 6 uh, the the condition for this matrix element to be non-zero is that I have the direct product of the vector in this case this transforms like the vector the direct product of the vector with the the for instance the initial state must contain The final state representation. Okay, this is the same selection rule that we have seen for uh, for uh, optical absorption, for instance. All right. So, what what in, in particular for this particular case of uh, vibrational properties? Most of the times, or not always, but many times, many times. The initial state is the ground state. Gamma i is the ground state. The, oh, sorry, psi i. Psi i is the ground state. The ground state, in terms of vibrations, mean means that uh, the molecule is not vibrating. 
right? It's a so-called zero point, zero phono uh, situation in which the amplitude of the um, vibrations it's uh, it's in the ground state. I'm I'm not I'm not going to say that it's zero because you have uncertainty. Uh, uh, principle and it's all always a, a zero point motion but uh, it's in the ground state of the vibrational states okay so in many times psi i is the ground state and you want to see what uh, what are the different possible final states starting from the ground state and the ground state transforms like the totally symmetric representation. Okay, so the, let's let's call a one <coughs> the identity representation because it's it's just the case as as all these uh, uh, little vectors that indicate the displacement, the normal modes. Uh, coordinates, if you imagine they are all zero, that just is telling us then that the, the ground state for the vibrational state is precisely the A1 uh, representation. Okay? Then the selection rule becomes much simpler because gamma i is the, the, the A1 representation, so uh, basically uh, you have to do the vector product, the direct product of uh, gamma vector with A1, which is just gamma vector. And then you, you, you just verify if your final state representation is contained in the gamma vector representation, and you are going to identify which modes are possible uh, uh, for final states in terms of uh, uh, absorption of infrared radiation. Okay, let, let me do some examples. Let, again, let's see the water molecule once again. So for the water, water molecule, uh, if you, if you uh, remember from the previous slide, the, the possible, uh, let me go back here, the, the, the modes, we, we got two A1 modes, and one B1 mode, and let's see which one of those are are, are uh, active by infrared absorption or not. Okay. So <clears throat> for the water molecule, uh, the 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 perturbation is the vector. So uh, gamma vector. Again, we have seen this from the previous slide. Is a one plus B1 plus B2 and therefore these are the possible final states so the possible final states are going to be given by gamma vector a direct product with A1 which is simply gamma vector so the possible final states for, for infrared absorption has have to have a, either A1 or B1 or B2 symmetries. Huh? Okay, for this group. And and uh, as we have seen uh, for the water molecule, we have only three modes: two A1 and one B1 mode. So that basically means that all of them, all of them are infrared active. All the three modes of water molecule are infrared active. Now, we can also uh, start to uh, figure out what are the different uh, polarizations, okay? So uh, if you remember, let let me go back here. A1, B1, B2 the, is the vector representation, but if you remember, A1 comes from the Z coordinate, B1 from the X coordinate, and B2 from the Y coordinate. That's telling 
uh, in terms of polarization that the two A1 modes they should be active by uh, light polarized along Z and the B1 mode should be active by uh, with the light polarization X and there should be no no mode polarized along uh, with an uh, electric field polarized along uh, Y and this is precisely what we can see and if you think of the induced dipole moments you see that when I have this type of the displacement for the A1 mode the induced dipole moment of this molecule is, is, is along this direction and this is same as this guy here so that's why this couples with the electric field component Z right but for the B1 mode and you see the if you look at the displacement you, you see there is a change of dipole moment along the X direction okay so this will couple with the X component of the electric field of the light so this is going to be active for polarization along X all right and there's no uh, there's no mode polar polarized along uh, Y <clears throat> all right so this is an experimental plot showing that uh, indeed when you have uh, infrared absorption of the water molecule you see precisely the three modes that we have discussed so far the the symmetric stretch the asymmetric stretch and the bending mode at different frequencies this two stretching modes at higher frequency and this bending mode at at, uh, at uh, smaller frequency so the three of them are seen by infrared so they are active by infrared okay all right let let's finish this lecture by uh, doing an, another example which is the one of the problems in our textbook is the uh, problem 8.1 and this problem uh, as you can see here is first of all find the normal modes of a triangular cluster contain containing three hydrogen atoms in the corner of an equilateral triangle so this is the system we have uh, suppose this is an equilateral triangle in which I have three hydrogen atoms I can label them one two three and uh, this is a hypothetical system okay but let's see what are the, the normal modes find the normal modes indicate which modes are infrared active forget about Raman ac activity uh, I'm going to talk about Raman activity uh, next time let's just uh, find the normal modes and see what are the uh, the, the the Raman, the infrared active modes. All right. Okay. So first step, identify the symmetry group. This we have worked with this uh, symmetry group before. Is the D3H group. Okay. So we have the, all the symmetry operations: identity, uh, horizontal plane, two C3 plus or minus two pi over three rotations improper rotations uh, c2 prime sigma v okay all right so we have identified the group so let's uh, obtain the uh, equivalence representation and uh, i have done that already we have actually this is similar to what we did last time for the molecular states of the uh, c4 c4 hypothetical molecule so we know the atom site representation uh, it I uh, just wrote it here and I can decompose it into the a1 prime and the e prime irreducible representations of the group so this is a1 prime and e prime okay so so what do do we do now we um, calculate the the symmetries of the normal modes 
for the vibration of normal modes and using the recipe that we have uh, introduced or presented to you uh, I calculate gamma vibration as the direct product between gamma atom sites and gamma vector minus gamma translations minus gamma rotations okay so where what is the gamma vector gamma vector then z is a2 prime xy is e prime so gamma vector let me write it right here it's also the same as gamma translation always the same and this is equal to uh, a2 prime sorry a2 double prime z coordinate and uh, e prime which is x y okay um, so this is, is going to be equal to a1 prime plus e prime times gamma vector a to double prime plus e prime minus gamma translations which is a double prime plus e prime sorry minus and then I have to subtract gamma rotation gamma rotation I have to look here is uh, RZ is a2 prime and um, RX RY is E double prime so this is for RZ this is for RX RY so I have to subtract a2 prime and e double prime okay so we start to get smart about this you, you know that this is uh, this is the same as this so this cancels with this guy here right and so let's do the the other products so I have a2 double prime times e prime so a2 double prime times e prime you see that you multiply by minus so this is a uh, a2 this is e double prime this is e double prime now we have e prime times e prime so uh, we have done actually this last time so I'm going to just write the result. Uh, this is uh, a1 prime plus a2 prime plus e prime. Okay, minus the rotations. Okay, so this cancels and this cancels. Then the result is simply a1 prime. plus e prime all right interesting so this is different to with than the water molecule now i have uh, one non-degenerate vibrational mode and i have one two-fold or double degenerate vibrational mode okay okay so uh, let's try to find the normal modes uh, displacements and again we can guess or, or use our physical insight that 
there should be there must be a uh, breathing mode in this problem right so uh, I can already uh, anticipate that the a1 prime the totally symmetric representation is going to be the breathing mode so all the three hydrogen atoms vibrating radially so this is not hard to guess that this is the this is the a1 prime mode so but now we are left with this, a more difficult problem of trying to find what are the two partners corresponding to the e prime double degenerate mode so this is a less simple this is not so simple let's see how we can do that so to do that we we have to use a projection operators okay so so using the projection operators to find the e, e prime e prime modes so let me draw again our little triangle here and let me label this is very This is my triangle. And let me label my atoms, my hydrogen atoms, one, two, and three. So, once again, I'm, I'm trying to find. Uh, the normal modes re uh, transforming according to the E prime representation. So I have to apply the projection operator P E prime to a certain function F and the, the result is uh, LN over H dimensionality of representation divided by the order of the group and then the sum over all symmetry operations, the characters for each symmetry operation, and the symmetry operation R on the, the original function F. Okay? So that so that what what you need to do is to be smart about the choice of the initial function f that you want to project so let me choose this function f which is a radial displacement on atom one so this is what what i i, I, I will use this notation r one indicating this is a radial displacement with respect to the uh, center of the triangle this is a radial displacement on atom one and this is this is going to be my starting function f okay and let's see what we get when we apply the the, the projection operator so let me apply the projection operator associated to this e prime I irreducible representation on my little vector r1 radial displacement on atom one and this is two divided by six uh, sorry no this is one this is uh, two divided by twelve so it's one over six it's not so important this is just a normalization but then okay let's see uh, the character of the identity times the identity so if the character of the identity is two because it's a two uh, double degenerate re representation a double uh, two-dimensional representation 
So it's two, and when I apply the identity, I get the same thing. So I get R1. All right. Uh, what is the next symmetry operation? The next symmetry operation is sigma h. Sigma h, again, it doesn't change this displacement vector at all. So when I, and the character, the character is also two, right? The character for this is two, the character is also two for, for the E prime representation. So I get, again, two times R1. Okay, now I have the two C3 operations. The two C3 operations, uh, if you think about it, when I rotate this system either by 2 pi over 3 or minus 2 pi over 3, I get R2 and R3, right? You can verify that. And the character, what is the character? The character is minus 1. So this is minus R2 minus R3. And you can see that this is going to be the same thing for the two S3 operations. Minus R2, you can verify that, minus R3. And the other characters are zero, so that's, that's, that's the end. So this is, this is the identity, this is a sigma uh, H, This is uh, C3, 2C3, and this is 2S3, right? And the other characters are zero. And then I'm done. So the result of that exercise is 1 third. Two R one minus R two minus R three. So let me draw. Let me draw these these uh, normal modes. So I'm, I'm going to call this. Uh, let's see, E prime one, the first partner of. Uh, of the uh, E prime representation. So E prime 1 looks like this. If I draw my triangle again, it uh, twice positive radial component on R1. So this is a kind of a big vector here, positive. And uh, on, uh, on 2 and 3, we have the opposite sign, so inward, and uh, the amplitude, so the, the magnitude is twice smaller. Okay, so this is one of the partners of, uh, of the E prime representation. Okay, so what could be the other partner? So uh, let me uh, choose a starting vector now that I call theta, theta 1, which is a tangential theta 1, which is a, a tangential uh, uh, displacement on atom 1, okay? This is going to be now my starting vector, my starting function for applying the uh, projection operator. Why did I choose that? Because I know from start that the two partners of the uh, two-fold representation E prime, they must be orthogonal to each other, right? So I start by choosing at least on atom one a displacement vector that it's precisely orthogonal to the the one I had before, which is R1. So this is a sensible choice of an initial vector. Okay, so let me see what's the result of that choice. So then uh, let me try. Let me calculate now.
let me project data one and uh, you can see uh, you have you can, you can you have you 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 can do this by yourself but I think it's obvious that in the end, you're going to get something that's very similar to this guy, right? The only difference is that instead of radio, you're going to get tangential for R1 and for, for atom 1, for atom 2, for atom 3. So I'll, I'll leave that to you so you can verify, but in the end, you, what you're going to get is basically this guy. I hope this is uh, makes sense to you. But if not, you can just do the calculation and and uh, see how the different vectors transform according to the different symmetry uh, operations of the group. You're gonna get precisely that. And this is what I call the E prime two is the second partner of the irreducible representation and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's clear that it's, it's orthogonal to the other part and just because uh, radial vectors are orthogonal to tangential vectors so that's why I was smart in choosing the, the initial vector. So what I'm calling E prime 2, it's actually this normal mold I have uh, atoms 1, 2, and 3. This guy is positive This guy is also tangential, it's negative. And this guy also tangential negative. Okay. So and you can see that the for both of those modes the molecule is not translating at all and it's not rotating at all at all. So you can see these are true vibrational modes and they are orthogonal to each other okay of course uh, whatever linear combination of these two eigenmodes uh, is also going to be uh, a, a, a perfectly valid eigenmode for this frequency so uh, this is not a unique uh, solution whatever linear combination of those two modes is going to give you other two modes which are also uh, uh, good choices of um, normal modes coordinate but this is a, a very sensible choice okay so now let's see let's uh, discuss the infrared activity the infrared activity of, of these modes okay for so infrared active modes If my initial state is the ground state, then the final state is given by uh, gamma vector and we have already calculated gamma vector gamma vector is a two double prime. This is A2 double prime plus E prime. This is Z. This is XY. So I can only find the final states either A2 double prime or E prime as active states. But we have already calculated the vibrational modes of this molecule. And I have A1 prime and E prime. Right? So, A1 prime is not active, 
only E prime. Okay. So the result of that is that uh, for the for the for this molecule. A1 prime, so or in other words, only the E prime mode is active, is infrared active, and it's going to be active in the XY polarization. And uh, The E1 prime, the, the, the perfectly symmetric uh, breathing mode, is silent. We say that it's silent in infrared. You cannot observe that in infrared. And uh, is, it, this is interesting to... This is, uh, it, it makes sense, because if you look at the A1 prime mode, you see that there's no dipole moment being induced by this totally symmetric displacement, right? Dipole mo moment is zero before and zero after you apply the displacement. So it should not couple to the electromagnetic uh, field. And this is, this is not the case for the E prime modes. Okay. So this is this uh, example. Now, next time we we're, we're going to discuss the Raman activity. I, I can go back here next time. So let's do the the letter B of this uh, problem set 8.1. Find now the normal modes for a hypothetical planar NH4 molecule where the N the nitrogen atom is in the center. So it's the same. It's similar. It's a similar problem. I have again the the equilateral triangle with three hydrogen atoms. But now I add a nitrogen atom in the center. So what what is the changes that I get when I do that? Okay. So let's do that again. Let's calculate the, the equivalence representation. So. If I calculate the equivalence representation now, you notice that the nitrogen is invariant for all symmetry operations of the group, right? Because it's right in the middle of the triangle. So it's very easy to get the equivalence representation for this molecule, starting from the equivalence representation for, that I had before for the triangle. I just have I just have to sum number one for all the symmetry operations because I know that the hydrogens are going to be just like they were before, but the nitrogen is going to be invariant for all symmetry operations. So the result is very simple. It's going to be I just add the number one for all the the representation that I had before. So I have four, four, one. One, two, two, and you, you can notice that bef what I had before is was a one prime plus e prime. So I have just to sum one more a one prime. So I get two a one prime plus e prime as the decomposition of the uh, equivalence representation. So I hope that makes sense to you. Okay, so good. So let's. Let's calculate now. Let's calculate now the vibrational representation, and this is the product of the equivalence representation with the vector representation. Minus the vector representation. Minus the rotation. This is the same, right? This is the same as I had before. It's the same point group. Okay, so uh, this cancels with this two here. 
and I get a one prime plus a prime plus a two double prime plus a prime. This is then equal to a one prime plus a two double prime plus two times a prime. Okay. So let's compare this result with the result I had before, only in, in which I had only hydrogen atoms. When I had only hydrogen atoms, this is what I got: a one prime plus e prime. Now that I have a nitrogen atom in the middle, I get three more modes. I get one a two prime mode and one e prime mode. So uh, extra modes that I get when I add the nitrogen atom are the e two prime. Sorry, e two double prime plus another E prime. So let's try to figure out what those modes should look like. It's interesting that I now I have a, a, a two double prime mode. So let's look at the A two double prime mode. It transforms like the Z coordinate. This is interesting because now I have vertical displacements. The presence of a nitrogen atom here uh, gives me the possibility of having vertical out of plane displacement okay and uh, it's not gonna be hard to figure out that uh, a, a way to construct this normal mode is to make uh, a, a upward displacement on the nitrogen and downward displacement on the hyd hydrogen atom so the hydrogens move down when the, the nitrogen moves up and vice versa. So this is a vibrational mode transforming it according to A2 double prime is an out of plane mode. Okay. So what about the, the other E prime modes? Uh, this is, is harder. Uh, I, I'm gonna leave it to you as an exercise, but uh, if you wanted to get the E prime modes, there's no other way. You, you want, it's not easy to guess. You have to use projection operators. So uh, I'll leave that to you if you want to do that. Okay. What about infrared activity? What are the infrared active modes? This is the same as before. So the infrared active modes, once again, they are A2 double prime plus E prime. But uh, before, uh, in the previous uh, example, I didn't have A2 double prime mode, right? I had only E prime, A and A1 prime. So, but in this case, I have E to the bro prime, and this is going to be infrared active along Z. Z polarized. Okay. So for the this hypothetical molecule, the final result is that I have uh, one A one prime mode silent on the infrared we're not discussing Raman yet uh, a two prime infrared active along Z and two sorry e double prime a two double prime and two e prime modes infrared active along XY polarization okay very good. So this is the end of this exercise, and this is the end of this lecture, and see you next time. Thank you.